Hello, Internet. It's the Uncultured Saints. We have not seen each other for a while for this. Ugh, no, it's been a it's been a long while. We we've, we've been trying to, but I don't think we know how to do it anymore. And it doesn't matter because nobody listens or watches now, huh? Watches? Yeah, I can't really wait to offer this in way more platforms so that the same people can not pay attention to it. <laughs> no, no, uh, vast vastly more people can ignore it. That's, I mean, if you think about it that way, yeah. I mean, with the way that the Earth's population is booming, we're actually losing viewers as we speak. Right. It's <laughs> awesome. And, and when you when you throw it up on the video platforms for people to, to pass by and be like, no. Both of these faces are just made to, yeah, capture you. There's no possible way that I'm going to waste time on that. Not when I got Joe Rogan out there. Well, 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 also... That's bad. I don't know. I can't stand Joe Rogan experience. What? I just can't. Really? Really. It just doesn't do it for okay. me. I don't have Why I don't not? have four hours a day to listen to somebody ramble. No, listen, I don't uh, I don't know who does. I'm sure there's plenty of people who do that, which is why he's a gajillionaire. But um no, I you know, I just occasionally if he's got an interesting guest, I'll I'll listen to the seven minute snippet. That's right. maybe a better approach because, like, I listen to my podcast on like the fast beats. Everybody talks like a chipmunk, and even yeah. I can't. Even that's too much. No, I just take the snippets, right? I mean, that's the better way to get the whole uh, uh, understanding of the entirety of the show. Just like uh, proof texting out of scripture. <laughs> just, um, right? <laughs> just, yeah. I only read them just, red letters. Right. That's all I'm gonna read. That's it. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, uh, you you read for this, right? I did, yeah. So you're saying I you read, read the Confessions more than the Bible? I understand. No, no, no. I just, I, I was ready. I was uh, getting ready, and I read uh, the large catechism. And uh, Nope, we're doing it, small cult articles. Oh. This is going to be great. I love this. So the small cult <laughs> articles, again, are, are Luther's kind of last will and testament, being angry towards the Roman Catholic Church because he knows he's going to die soon. Uh, so he's laying it all on the table, right? But he doesn't, but he doesn't die. No, but I get that feeling. He thinks he's going to die. I thought I was going to die and get out of having to record this, but here we yeah. are. Yeah. Did you did, did you have a heart attack too? Just like I, Luther? I'm going to try. I mean, okay. we'll see if I can just yes. get out of the rest of this somehow. Um, we left off with the invocation of saints. Um, and it's a fun thing to talk about uh, if you're really, really nerdy and into theology. But it's also an important thing because it has a lot to do with how we pray today. Um, the invocation of saints, the idea that the saints in heaven pray for you. True or false? The saints in heaven pray for you. Yeah, true or false? Well, if you're taking it from Revelation, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, the saints on earth pray for you. True or false? True. Okay. That more important than Jesus? No. There we no, go. No, absolutely not. Right. Right. And so this is really all that we need to talk about with this. And Luther is actually really good in sort of how he measures this. Uh, we laid out the chief article on which the church stands or falls, which is justification, that Jesus died for sinners, and only because of this you are right before God. And so anything that takes away from Jesus for sinners is bad. It's good that people pray for you. It's good to have people pray for you. And you know what? Whether or not you ask them to, the saints in heaven and on earth pray for you. But that doesn't do more than Jesus. So don't worry. So this was connected, if if you remember, this was connected, uh, the invocation of saints is kind of a, a, a prologue to uh, the, the mass, the article on the mass, mm -hmm. right? And so the mass was, uh, Luther was talking about all of the ways in which <clears throat> the mass within the Roman Catholic Church uh, was uh, not scriptural, was actually taking away from Jesus. So tie this invocation to saints uh, to that very same thing. That's that's Luther's issue. Again, not so much because, goodness, I, we when we go to divine service, uh, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's, that's good. Saints, that's saints praying for saints. Um, I, I certainly ask my uh, my my brothers uh, to, to pray for me and, and vice versa. That's that's a good thing as well. Um, it's bad, like though, would, to think that God is more likely to hear because he only listens to the popular kids. Right. And it, I think even within Luther, Lutheran circles, we can uh, we can have that happen um, where uh, our parishioners will come up to us pastors and ask for us to pray for them. Mm -hmm. 
because we have a more direct line to to God. That's the that's the yeah. thought process. And and the weird thing is, that's the exact same thought process uh, that the Roman Catholic Church was, and and I'm going to say still, it still does. does understand in regards to the invocation of saints that i'm reaching out to saint peter because obviously saint peter is going to have this direct line straight to jesus really the only difference is that they put different saints in charge of different prayers whereas we expect your grandma schmidt to cover all of them so like here at least the roman catholics are clever like my favorite my favorite saint and and i can't i would i would hate myself if i didn't waste your time talking about this right now um, i think you've already said it. I, I i i can bet who you're gonna say Tell me. Bartholomew. I love it so much. This is the best. <laughs> <laughs> the man was skinned alive. And so they made him they made him the saint of leather workers. Yeah, Tanners. It's, it's great. the best. I actually I actually mentioned that in a Bible study to uh, last night. Um, and uh, one of my parishioners, uh, she really did not like that. Like she she was like very uh downhearted because of it it's like oh i can't I, I can't even fathom i can't believe they did that and it's like yeah that that's crazy isn't it inflection like, is so important because like <laughs> oh i can't believe they did that is somehow different than when i said i can't believe they did that <laughs> right and, and i mentioned it, it is an odd thing because you don't have uh, uh john the baptist as the patron saint of uh, axe axe makers that would right? be amazing <laughs> Uh, no, but eh. so I guess the question is, I mean, we could go down that that road for a, a long time and, and make fun of all of that. Um, and there's probably a, a right uh, reason uh, to do that. I'm here um, for it. <laughs> but I guess my question is, um, in regards to the Roman Catholic Church then, in, in Luther's day and age, and, and we could probably say even still today, um, why did they do that? You said they were very clever of putting uh, of putting uh, Peter in charge of this and Bartholomew in charge of Tanners and uh, fill in the blank, right? Patrick in charge of snakes or whatever, right? Um, why did they do that? I mean, the word for it is, if we're going to be blunt, the word for it is idolatry. This is this is always what we want is if you're going to measure things by works, then there needs to be a worker. Um, and so it's it's actually um, the, the very same, at least intention behind the paganism that finds the spirits in the trees, even if they won't actually call the saints gods. Um, we, we like to sort of say, I know what lever to pull to get this result, which is how how you define idolatry. It's, it's you being God or you trying to control him. Yeah, uh, that's exactly how Luther puts it. And, and then he also infers, uh, I think, um, uh, that uh, that if they if they do away with all the saints, um, and again, I, Luther's very blunt now, remember, because he, he does think that he's dying tomorrow. Um, and he says, uh, if, if, if they do away with all the saints, uh, they're going to lose so much money. Because they've got so many things that are dedicated to the saints, so that there's so many practices, so many uh, revenue streams. All of the relics. Oddly enough, all of the relics, all of the uh, uh, different uh, chapels that you, uh, uh, you you pay a donation to in mm -hmm. order to go there and pray and fill in the blank and all this sort of stuff. That if you if you basically say, "Hey, uh, saints aren't any better than me or you," mm -hmm. um, then you're going to lose all of that tomorrow. Right. And he kind of goes on to say, like, look, if, if you want to give up the money, then maybe we can have this conversation. But as long as that's there, it's it's sort of ridiculous to pretend that this is this is an unbiased conversation. It would sort of be like if we somehow went viral on YouTube and, and we had millions of people watching us and we made money from it <laughs> and we actually kept the money for it instead of letting higher things actually continue to support the, the uh, ministries of the church, making the gifts of Christ Jesus known to youth and young adults. But um, somehow we became millionaires from this podcast and we insisted that YouTube was essential to ministry. And somebody said, well, no, it's not. But we can't really talk about it because the only reason you care so much about YouTube might just maybe be that you're making money from it. Right. But I mean, I, I'm... Fortunately, we never... will never have that problem. Well, and, you know, intrinsically, I'm, I'm not a greedy man. 
I don't, I don't know about you, but I, you know, I couldn't care less. So I wouldn't have that issue. Personally. To quote the hymnist again, um, <laughs> cash does move everything around me. <laughs> Cream, get the money. Dollar, dollar bills, y'all. Yeah. So and, me... and there's only two of them. So that's how, that's how well I'm doing with it. <laughs> okay. So let me ask you this because also okay. in this small little, uh, it's only what two paragraphs yeah. long. This section of the invocation of saints, but it says um, that we shouldn't actually ascribe specific days uh, uh, to the the veneration of these saints and, and and all of that. And yet, to put to put you on the spot there, Pastor, uh, I just opened up our LSB um, and I'm looking at uh, uh, a whole page and a half of feasts and festivals that say the uh, the feast of Saint Andrew and the feast of Saint Thomas and the feast of Saint Stephen. Um, so is this pot calling kettle black? What, what's going so on here? The, the difference I think is actually in that word veneration, which is a fancy word. So, um, instead let's, let's sort of say there's a difference between a day set aside to talk about why this person was actually a, a good example to, to remember this person as a brother or a sister in Christ and rejoice that they are saved and see what we can learn from Christ working grace in their lives and a day set aside to pray specifically to them so that we can have extra Jesus points that will be cashed in by that person for us through the Pope from the Treasury of Merit, which is a pretty crazy system. Yeah. No, that's that's a, that's a really good answer. Um, yeah. And, and, it, <laughs> and I think you're exactly right. Uh, uh, in, in, in the same way that uh, take take yourself out of the realm of uh, uh, Christianity and put yourself just in the realm of secular, in the same way that that we can and should uh, look to different historical figures um, and actually maybe set a, a, a specific day aside to kind of see what they did and, and how they contributed and fill in the blank to X, Y, and Z, right? That's a good thing to do for us and to know our history and all of that. Uh, kind of in the same vein, this this uh, um, feasts and festivals, uh, it's good for the church to set these aside. And again, mostly if you if you take a look at the readings that we use for those particular days, um, you get to see it's it's really but the readings are all not look how awesome Paul was, but it was look what God is doing through Paul, right. Right. And there, I think it actually becomes a, a wonderful example to Christians who might struggle with the same things that Paul struggles with. Um, that that when Paul lays out, you know, chief of sinners, though I be, um, we, we get to actually start to wrestle with what it is to sort of have two wants within us. The Romans 7 that both wants the things that God commands and the things that he forbids. Um, we get to go to, to St. Joseph, we get to go to, I'm, I'm going to go always to St. Bart and say, you know what? It, it's actually probably a, a feeling to have one of those really profound confessions of faith, but to be called the wrong name um, after I do it because John is busy fighting with Peter. Maybe maybe I can actually find some hope in the fact that God sees me in my baptism and, and here finds value regardless of whether or not I get to do all the cool stuff. Yeah. Thomas, doubting. Booping the Lord, right? Yeah, boop. Peter. Yeah, it doesn't say. That it doesn't say he booped ever booped it. the Lord. We never no, actually. No. We don't know. No. If yeah, I hope yeah. it made that noise. If it did happen. Yeah. Well, but yeah. That's all. I'm but I mean, no. It, it inside of all of this, it's going to be the same way we do all of these things. Does this take away from Jesus? If it takes away from Jesus, I don't want to do it. And so the next thing that we could talk about then would be like monasteries, which I, at one point in time were apparently started with the best of intentions, and it's almost like our great intentions can go bad. Uh, but monasteries were started uh, to teach. They, they were places where you could go to learn more about your Lord. They were places where you could gather together um, and, and rejoice that, that Christian virtue actually is something to be lauded and celebrated. But the problem was, uh, by the end of these things, you, you had a, a place where you were somehow holier if you lived there and prayed all day, regardless of the fact that you might, like, I don't know, leave your wife and children to go and do it as if you were somehow accomplishing a more holy work. And well, where's Jesus? And also, where's your kids? Yeah. No, that, so that's the, the third article in this section here, which is the, the chapters and the cloisters. And remember, um, uh, unlike uh, you and I, uh, Luther has firsthand knowledge of this, 
right? He's he spent a a good amount of time uh, under these these rules and rubrics, kind of learning and understand and being taught that no, that the the works that you're doing uh, are are these good divine works that are going up into that treasury of the saints. So people are relying on you to do all of this sort of stuff so that because they're nothing more than a fisherman or a tanner or fill in the blank, um, they can't actually win for themselves these good works and these good deeds in, in, in light of God standing before him. They need you to do it. So uh, it's, it's weird. I think one of two things can happen then to uh, somebody in a, a monastery um, and it's two ends of the, uh, of the spectrum of the pendulum swing. And one is where Luther got, uh, where the, the weight was so heavy upon him, the burden of him, uh, first and foremost, being able to fulfill these good works for his own sake. But then uh, with the fact that uh, the people out there, like his parents, right, or his, his siblings or whatever, his, his childhood friends, uh, were banking on him to fulfill all of these good works for their good. Um, that just drove him to despair, mm -hmm. just complete and utter despair. And, and again, that's, that drove him away from Christ. So all the focus was on himself and he knew that he couldn't actually do these things as what was prescribed for him. Even, even these man-made rituals that were prescribed for him, he knew that he wasn't doing them perfectly. And so he had this doubt of whether or not they were meriting anything. Um, and it just drove him to complete uh, a despair and almost insanity. And then the other end of the spectrum uh, is uh, uh, the people parading think they're around, actually doing it, right? And parading around, thinking that you are holier than thou because of what you're doing. And and the odd, well, the odd thing is, and this is what you kind of say to um, all of these are man-made works. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the fact that you have to pray, uh, you know, all the hours of the day and, uh, every single week, uh, make sure that you, uh, uh, sing the psalmody all the way through three times and fill in the blank with all these other stuff. Right. Right. Uh, the, the thought was that these were actually good works that merited, uh, salvation. Um, and they were despising, uh, the good works of being a husband to your wife. They were despising the good works of being a father to your children or just being the, the, the very good work of serving your neighbor as a fisherman. They were saying that that, that is nothing. That's pointless. That's evil. Um, worthless. Uh, and it's the oddest thing. It's, it's uh, uh, just a crazy form. And I think everything gets back to it. It's, it's just another Gnosticism. It's another way of looking at the things of this temporal world as evil. Um, well, but and, it also becomes really perverse in that you're trying to please God by ignoring the things that he commanded you to do. Um, mm -hmm. And this is actually what we always do. It, it doesn't sound like it makes sense, but this is always what we do to the law is when you're given a law that you can't do, you try and come up with one that you can do. And so, like, honestly, being being a father and a husband is hard, especially if you want to do it right, especially if you want to do it according to God's command without sin, because it's utterly selfish less and i am totally selfish and so you know what's better maybe i'll just pray for them instead of actually help them that that's that's easier so let's let's make some more laws about how many times i have to pray for them so that i don't feel bad about not actually taking care of them i can actually but i can also then actually check it off too right and say i'm done right and it's so much easier to have that uh, you know five times okay good i did it done Ooh, now wonderful now I'm right but you, but you didn't put any clothes on the back or food on the table, and you didn't teach them what it means to uh, to uh, grow up as uh, as under the the Lord. Um, but that's okay. You ran away from your family and joined a monastery. Well done. And, and I mean, not only now are you you leaving them to probably have some real baggage towards the church uh, that they have no real place to talk about it with, but you also yourself are trying your very best not depend not to depend on Jesus when that's the only place that you're going to find hope. Again, go back to the first article. Does this take away from Christ who is crucified for sinners? If it does, get rid of it. It's, it's real simple. Right. Yeah. If it does damage to that. Um, so uh, let me ask this then. How does how does this article? Because this is uh, a lot of the things that we find in in uh, 
the Book of Concord, some of our audience might not actually think as uh, relevant today. Like how in the world are chapters and cloisters going to affect the average uh, 14 year old Lutheran out there? So, I mean, at the end of the day, you're right. Uh, the average high schooler is probably not considering joining a monastery or praying to St. Bartholomew for a new belt. Um, but at the same time, I, I think actually most of how we conduct ourselves religiously is still flirting with the same song and dance. Are we doing something that circumvents Jesus? Are we taking away from Christ in our works? Um, and in all of it, what does church do for you? Like, are, are you going because you can pray your way up to heaven, or are you going because you're burdened down and you need him to lift you up? That's probably um, Google. That's probably Google. Do you need to? Do you need to answer this live? No. That's gonna be no. fun. It's gonna be fun. I don't think. I don't think I'm going to. Okay. No, I'm just gonna let that one ring. You would get extra Jesus points if you answered it. I know, but we can't. Uh, we can't edit out like we used to be we able can't. to when we we're just doing audio. That's all right. So if it's like a legitimate conversation, I can't. I can't tell him to go away. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you could. It'd be funnier for me, but probably bad right. for <laughs> bad for the people you've been given to serve. Um, right. <laughs> so uh, on, on that note, um, I, I mean, the other oh, thing. Hold on, hold- Oh, I thought you were going to plow ahead. I don't even know if we have time to, because we want to keep this to 30 minutes. Yeah, I actually kind of want to just finish here um, and and actually where it matters for us today. Okay. Yeah. All right. I can, I can, uh, I can string this out for another. Does your youth group make you holier than not going to youth group? Does, in all of the places that, that we, we go to higher things conference, does it make you holier for going to church five times a day or, or, or not? Uh, in all of these things, are you doing to the thing, the, the things that take you to Jesus or are you doing these to replace him? That's, that's really simple. Right. Uh, and I think, I know growing up, even as a lifelong Lutheran, I, I had this feeling And I think this is just intrinsically in us for one reason or another. And we kind of talked about this in regards to the invocation of the saints, how it plays out um, even within our our Lutheran circles, because certainly uh, we're not uh, trying to pray to our uh, deceased grandma and we're not trying to pray to Peter. uh, But then we go to the pastor and ask him to pray for us because that more direct line. Um, But then also, I think it can play out into the chapters and cloisters in regards to Like you said, um, do we think that certain vocations are inherently holier or stand before God in a better place than others? Um, I remember growing up and thinking um, that I didn't want to be a pastor, uh, but uh, I felt bad because being a pastor would be better than anything else I could do. Right. That uh, I would have this guilt. Uh, Right. But but inherently, we have this thought process that, uh, okay, working in the church um, is uh, is the best thing that you can do. I remember having uh, uh, in my first parish, I had this uh, this guy come in uh, and he and his wife had been kind of church hopping. And this was going to be the last the last church that he had been uh, going to. Um, because he was just, he was fed up and he was going to those big box churches and every big box church that he was going to, um, uh, he was uh, kind of uh, f- guilted into uh, joining the the praise band because he was a professional drummer. Um, and they would guilt him all the time that uh, doing drum lessons or doing, uh, doing gigs with his band um, was not a good and proper work. And, and actually, if he wanted to be serving God, uh, then he needed to, to bring his, uh, his masters in music and his ability to drum. He needed to bring that to that praise band. That was the only way that he could serve God uh, in his vocation. And there was just so much just dread and guilt uh, that he always had. And I, I remember uh, the first time he came through, he reluctantly told me what he was, that he was a drummer. I said, awesome. Do you play in a band? He's like, yeah, I play in a Led Zeppelin cover band. I was like, that is the coolest thing that I've ever heard in my life. I'm going the next time you have a show. And he was just bamboozled. Uh-huh. Right. Uh, and so, I, I mean, I can't top Led Zeppelin cover band, but I, I can I can emphasize the point. Uh, in all of these things, you don't need to add to your salvation. 
And I know that we know this on paper, but there are these little practices that we have that reinforce bad ideas. And sooner or later, if you just keep doing them over and over again, like I just ask yourself, like what happens if you are sick in the hospital and nobody in church prays for you? What happens if nobody on the internet prays for you? You're going to hell. Jesus still died on the cross. Jesus still conquered death. And so God still deals with you in the same mercy as if you are his holy and beloved child and God takes care of his kids. That's it, right. it, it's relax. What happens if you went to Easter vigil and had to duck out halfway through? Um, hypothetically. 18 and a half services. Yeah. 18 and a half services. Right. Uh, six seasons in a movie. Um, what, yes. what if? Yes. What six if? Six seasons in a movie. <laughs> That's awesome. What if you fall short of actually getting the movie? Um, Jesus still died for you. And that's the thing we want to focus on. Of all of the practices in church, if they're not expressly commanded by God or forbidden by God, the simplest question is, do they point to Jesus or take away from Jesus? Do it that way. And 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 certainly uh, different situations can, uh, let me say it this way. Uh, when you go to higher thing, higher things conferences during the summer, yes, you go and you do five services for five times a day. Um, and then when you go home, you don't, and that's okay. It's good in both situations, right? Honestly, I don't have because, time to do five services a day and still get all my stuff done. Right, you're you're on quote unquote vacation, and you're you're that's a great way to five different it. services, yeah. right? But now I'm home actually doing my uh, my vocations. Um, and I'm, I'm going to work or I'm being a student or I've got my summertime job or fill in the blank with all these things. Yeah. Do all of those. And don't tell mom that you can't do your chores because you have to do matins. <laughs> I wonder if that, that's a great way to get out of chores though. <laughs> I just invented the monastery. Oh, crud. All right. We got to go. We got to go. Um, yeah, Uncultured Saints did. out. Well played. <laughs>